Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Ken Robinson. Well, thank you, Graham. And uh, please accept the hug uh, as it was intended. Uh, actually, <clears throat> I've been following some of the conference on the live feed. Uh, I think it's been great. So I, I, first thing I want to do is offer congratulations to Graham and all the people at Learning Without Frontiers for putting together a great event. I mean, it's, I think it's a real coup to have Noam Chomsky uh, with you and Ray Kurzweil and all the other great speakers you've had. Uh, of course, it's all been leading up to this moment, uh, as you can imagine. And uh, so I'm very pleased to be able to give the uh, a kind of few closing thoughts. Um, I was, uh, it's, uh, what is it now? It's nine o'clock in the morning here in Los Angeles. And uh, earlier I was having a cup of tea and some toast listening to Francis Gilbert, uh, who I thought was fantastic, Francis. If you're still in the room, I thought that was a great presentation. And uh, one of the things I wanted to underline is that this revolution of which you're speaking over the past few days has been building up for a very long time. It, it's not new, it's, uh, it's an incremental process. It's been being fed by many different sources. And the changes that I think need to be made are al already known to us. I don't think there's a mystery here. Um, so I want to say a few words just about the background to this revolution and some principles on which uh, we might consider moving forward. And then I think if you've still got time at your end, we might have some conversation for a few minutes before we're done. Um, I uh, was struck by Francis's references to the Plowden Report. Uh, I uh, trained as a teacher in 1968. That's when I started, 68 to 72. The Plowden Report was the big piece of work at the time. If you haven't seen it, by the way, I recommend that you do take a look at it. There have been many wonderful reports uh, that have been published from all kinds of sources about education. The revolution we're talking about has lots of antecedents. If you look at the whole uh, history of progressive education or liberal education, if you look at the work of Dewey, uh, who I know Noam Chomsky referred to uh, yesterday, uh, Montessori, Pestalozzi, um, there's a long and distinguished history of people who've been arguing against what has tended to dominate the mainstream culture of education. There have been tremendous critiques of education from uh, sociology, from, uh, from political theory, from philosophy. Um, I started out my career in, uh, is it a career? I don't know. Uh, I, I think <laughs> career means to be sp speeding out of control as well, isn't it? So I, I've, I've also been careering for quite a long time. But um, I started out in drama and theatre in education. And part of my interest in the doctoral thesis I wrote was to trace the history of drama in schools. And it seemed to me self-evident that what drama offered at its best in education was central to the purposes of education. It offered collaborative work, group work. It offered opportunities for kids to use their imaginations to express feelings and to explore the relationship of feelings to ideas. It offered opportunities to learn about cultural uh, histories and traditions, and it offered opportunities for the whole community of a school to come together at various points. I, I'm not confusing classroom drama with performance, but performance always seemed to me to be an important part of it. Um, so I was tracing the history of drama in schools, in part that was what I was doing uh, for my doctoral studies in the early 80s. Um, but I was always looking, also looking at what was going on in schools, and truthfully there had been an explosion of drama in schools, but it wasn't everywhere. There was a great book written uh, in the 50s, published by a man who some of you, I hope, will know, called Peter Slade, who was one of the founders of what he called child drama. Franz Chizek, uh, previous to Peter Slade, had written a book called Child Art that was published in the 40s. But you can go back much further than that into the 18th and 19th centuries um, to trace some of the origins of the progressive movement in schools, of which drama and, and uh, and other art disciplines were sometimes apart. Not always, but sometimes apart. Um, but there's always been a struggle, th this is the point I want to make, between uh, forms of education that focus on um, the whole child, uh, which recognize that learning is essentially personal and should engage 
all the talents of our students and it should engage their feelings and their values and their sense of community. There's always been a struggle between that conception of education and the tendencies of governments to want to control and test education as a public utility. Um, so a lot of my work I found uh, over the years has been uh, to try and encourage a conversation between three sorts of domains. Between practice, a lot of my work has been rooted in practice in school-based initiatives, school-based uh, reforms and so on. Um, I worked in universities for years, I ran teacher training programs, I was very interested in Francis talking about some of the perils of teacher training and he's quite right about it, I'll come on to that in just a minute. But my interest has always been in how do you improve practice, because if it doesn't happen in practice it's simply not happening. It has to happen in schools, in classrooms or wherever learning takes place. A second big interest of mine has been to connect what's happening in practice with theory. There's a lot to be gained from uh, the theories of education, particularly in sociology, psychology, now of course in neuroscience. Um, and it sounds axiomatic to say that, but one of the problems I find is that practitioners, with a few exceptions, don't have time for theory. I don't mean they're intolerant of it or can't be bothered with it, they just don't have time, they're too busy. People who work full time in theoretical fields can't keep up with the torrent of new initiatives, new papers, new books that come out. If you work in the university, if you get out of the research stream for more than a year, you, you'll be left behind. So it's hard to keep up with theory. So the problem is that practitioners don't have much time for theory. Um, theorists on the whole don't have much time for practice. They don't do a lot of it. it I mean, they don't teach in schools and so they don't know enough about practice. Uh, so theory and practice are the two big domains. The third is policy. I do believe we have to engage vigorously and actively in the policy debates and in the policy forum. Uh, the problem, as I say, is that theorists don't know a lot about practice very often and practitioners don't have enough time for theory. A larger problem is that policymakers very often don't know much about either, to be honest. They, they don't seem to know a lot about practice and they don't seem to involve themselves much in theory. In fact, a lot of politicians are self-consciously anti-theory. They think theory is a big problem. And we saw that in the attempts to make teacher education more utilitarian and more pragmatic. So this debate between theory, policy and practice is being continuous. Um, and it's now, I think, being given an extra significance by two big trends that have been the centerpiece of the conference. One is technology, and you've had Ray Kurzweil here. Ray knows more about what's happening in technology than most people. You had the wonderful presentation uh, uh, just before the break from Microsoft, which I thought was terrific. Um, technology is driving everything. I don't quite agree. I, I, I wasn't able to hear the whole of Noam Chomsky's speech. I, I, I gather, um, and I'll, I'll read the transcript, so forgive me if I've got this wrong, but I, I think he was sceptical that the current scale of technological change really is as significant as the changes in the 19th century. I think he may be proved wrong on that. Um, I think that uh, a world that's being connected through information systems, which are becoming more flexible and more pervasive, more um, intuitive, um, is going to bring about changes which are, at the moment, almost inconceivable, unless you happen to be Ray Kurzweil, who conceives them every day. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, as you know, is uh, a great advocate of what he calls the singularity, which is the point at which information systems will merge with the human mind. Well, I think that's a bigger deal than the telegraph, honestly. Um, I think if you've got extra gigabytes of memory intersecting with your amygdala, you know, that's quite a big shift. And I think it raises huge issues for personhood, for uh, social morality, for what we consider it is to be a person, and certainly for education. I can't imagine of a bigger shift in human consciousness than the merging of our minds with information systems. And it may seem a slightly odd prospect, but even un uh, unrealistic. But, you know, if you'd said to the architects of the telegram or the telegraph that you would be sitting here now with tablet devices that can connect you to every published item in the world and, well, I, don't, I need to tell you what the iPad can do, but they'd have thought you were Captain Kirk and, and indeed you are. So technology is a, a massive driver of change and its consequences are completely unpredictable and its course is unforeseen. 
Um, by the way, when I say that, I don't mean to say that nobody knows how technology itself may evolve. What we can never tell is how technology plays against the culture, uh, how people will use the technology, uh, how they will... I mean, when Steve Jobs announced the iPad, for example, and the iPhone, they built in a facility for apps, but they could not have anticipated the range of apps that are currently available and the ones that are in progress. A great generative idea attracts the creative energies of people who weren't involved in the initial concept at all. And so the cultural applications really become uh, tremendously dynamic and unpredictable. The second big driver that I know we've talked about at the conference is population growth, and this is quite new. Uh, we are heading towards nine, possibly 10 billion people on the planet. And on some calculations, that's a completely unsustainable number. It certainly is unsustainable if we propose to carry on behaving economically as we're behaving now and electing to try and feed people through the obscene process of fast food and industrial farming that are uh, pillaging the planet. I mean, it's, it's simply not feasible to continue along that course. So there has to be some radical shift here. And education is in the front line of the shift that we need to bring about. So this revolution's been building for a very long time. Uh, it's not new. It's not something that's happened since Michael Gove uh, got his new job. Um, and its antecedents, uh, both positive and negative, are historical and deeply rooted. But the challenges are fresh. So I believe the need to accelerate the revolution has never been more important. So What's involved in that? Well, I think the first thing is that it's important not to think of educational change as uh, linear um, or monolithic. Um, what I mean is that no social change is linear. You can plan industrial processes that are linear. You can, you can plan chemical and inert processes that are linear or physical processes. But as soon as you get feelings involved, as soon as you get people involved, as soon as you engage with the culture, as soon as you involve um, aspirations and hopes and um, anxieties and uncertainties and different ways of seeing the world, as soon as you're talking about social change, it's never linear, never. Uh, it's unpredictable and it's dynamic. And this is both a challenge and it's also our opportunity. It seems to me that, that, that education has uh, very clear purposes. I mean, I, I taught in universities for a long time and, uh, and worked in them. And uh, I know in the philosophy of education, we can develop entire semesters uh, on the aims of education. So I don't mean to minimize the complexities, uh, but I'm going to, because we need some agenda to work from. There are at least these purposes to education, which I think we should agree on. The first of them is economic. There was certainly a time in the history of progressive education where philosophers uh, and others didn't want to talk about what were referred to as extrinsic aims in education. That education should be seen as an intrinsic good uh, of benefit purely in terms of the people who are involved in it. And we shouldn't sully it with any sense of uh, social utilitarianism. Well, it's a naive view, I think. The, uh, I think the raw truth for most of us is that we assume that if we get better educated, if we get educated at all, that we'll be in a better place than otherwise to uh, find work, to be economically engaged, economically productive. And certainly it's one of the reasons that countries invest huge amounts of money in systems of public education. Uh, the assumption is that if they do that, they'll become economically more buoyant and more sustainable. Education does have very clear economic purposes. It doesn't mean that the purposes of education are only economic, but they are also economic. And you see the truth of that in the ideology of education all the time. It's evident in the hierarchy of disciplines. It's why the arts are at the bottom and why uh, maths and science are towards the top, because they're thought to be more useful. They're not, but that's the ideology. Um, it's uh, also evident in the, I think, uh, ridiculously um, negative division that's made between academic and vocational programs. Uh, certainly I grew up in the system that was dominated by this idea that, that there are some courses that are academic, which are for smart, clever people. And, uh, and you, d you don't need to take my word for that. A few years ago, if you passed the 11 plus, which was largely a test of academic ability, 
you went to a grammar school, and if you went to a grammar school, you'd get to a decent university, and uh, failing all that, uh, you might take a vocational program. That's still pretty much in the cultural DNA of education, uh, or for politicians very often, that there's um, a qualitative difference between academic and vocational. It seems to me the most ridiculous misconception, but it's one that we have to deal with. But it's part of the economic agenda of education that we need to engage with. Now, the challenge to me is that new technologies and the, uh, what Tom Friedman would call the flattening of the economies around the world mean that the economic agenda is completely different from the one that dominated the birth of public education in the 19th century. We need new sorts of education to meet these new economic circumstances. So the economic argument is powerfully on the side of a revolution. And I don't think we sh should shrink away from the economic argument. We should embrace it. Uh, because it, it actually supports the changes that I think we need to make for the other two parts of the agenda. The second big theme for education is cultural. Education is uh, one of the principal ways that we aim to pass on the cultural genes of our communities, the, to transmit our values, our beliefs, um, and our traditions and heritage. And that's not a bad thing. It seems to me that we suffer a great deal by forgetting the past. I, th I liked Francis' phrase earlier of uh, the of sort of collective amnesia. It's true. I think the uh, less engaged we are in the past and knowing how we came to be this way, the less capable we are of facing the future. We, it's the old maxim, if we forget the past, we're constantly condemned to relive it. So the cultural traditions are very important. Of course, they're contested and we need to think about uh, what should constitute the proper basis of that. But it's an agenda that we need to engage with fully and properly. And it's one, by the way, in which the arts and humanities have a very central role. What is true, I think, is that our um, cultural agendas now have to be global and not just local. They have to be international, not national. Because we live in the world that's increasingly complex, partly through the efforts of new technology, and a world that's increasingly intertwined. So the cultural agenda is profound. And the third one, is uh, personal. And I leave it to the end because it's the most important. It's something it seems to me that politicians of all parties too often forget. Education is in the end inevitably personal. When the Plowden report talked in the 60s about child-centered education, it seemed to me uh, to be a completely unnecessary expression because I thought, well, what else could it be? Uh, if you want students to learn, you have to engage them. Any teacher will tell you that. The problem, of course, is that uh, if education becomes dominated by uh, external aims uh, and uh, impersonal testing, then learners become disengaged and teachers become anxious and fraught in the center of this rather tense relationship. And that's, I think, increasing what's going on. But the agendas of personal, of personalizing education, of, of engaging with cultural complexity, and shifting economic purposes, I think we, we could, uh, at least I hope, agree on as the central, purpose, central core of what the, the revolution ought to address. The thing I just want to get to, though, is this, that there's often a tendency for, um, for people who work in education to believe there's nothing they can do. And I think the message of the conference ought to be there is everything you can do at whatever level that you operate. Uh, politicians of all parties, and I live in America now, and I can tell it's the case here, do have strong vested interests in education. Um, they impose views and systems and cultures on education. It's what Gramsci would have called cultural hegemony. Uh, and you see it evidently in education. There is an attempt to impose a particular view of social values uh, and of economic purposes on education, and then to support it with um, particularly uh, regimes of standardized testing to try and um, uh, to, uh, to find if there's a way of uh, making these aims kind of universally applicable and testable. The good news though to me is this, that education is not monolithic and as I said before it's not linear. Uh, education is much more what's sometimes called a complex adaptive system. Well, what it, that really just means is that it's a, it's a system with many elements, many moving parts, many uh, sometimes confluent and sometimes conflicting forces. It's, it's like a vortex. It's not like a, an undisturbed canal. It's, in many ways, it's like the open ocean. 
there are lots of forces and counter forces that run through education and if you teach you are one of them and perhaps one of the primary ones. Everyone's agendas are in play in education whether you're a politician, a student, uh, a parent uh, or a teacher uh, or a school superintendent or a CEO. Um, there have been numerous attempts to impose cultures on education but the, cu the culture itself is too complicated to simply give into it. There is inertia in the system, there is optimism, there's hope in the system and all these things have to be taken into account. If politicians could control education they would have done it before now. Uh, actually they can't because the system doesn't quite work that way. So I think it's important to recognize that the revolution that we're discussing as well as being urgent is in process and it won't come from the top. Revolutions never come from the top. Uh, they always come from the bottom. They come from grassroots movements of people doing what they think is the right thing in their current situation but being part of a larger process of social change and connecting with others who are moving in the same direction. And the new technologies give us every opportunity to do exactly that. There are some principles, I just want to end on this, I think some principles that we might observe here. The first is that education will only work now and in the future if it is personalised and we might talk more about what that really means but we do have the tools now to uh, contour education to every single student in the system. Um, the technologies of gaming uh, provide for that but they're not the only ones. That The whole uh, ethic really and, and drive of information systems is that you can personalise them to your own uses and your own interests. Uh, and we never had that before. Uh, secondly, we do have to customise education to the individual communities where it's actually taking place. I think this is really important, you know, that for any given student, education, the education system is not what happens in the committee rooms in Westminster or in the committee rooms of our local authorities. The education system for any given student is the school they go to, that's it, uh, or in the classrooms they sit in. If you're a teacher, you are the education system. If you're a school head teacher, you're the education system for those kids. So you can change the world of education for them immediately if you choose to. And I think if enough of us do that, that adds up to a social movement. And that is what a revolution is in the end. So let me just give you these few principles to, to, uh, to summarise some of the conversations I think that have been taking place. There are at least these bits of education we need to attend to. The curriculum, uh, learning, teaching and learning, and assessment. There are others, but just in the time available, um, let me contrast something. I think we need to see, we need to accelerate the shift in the curriculum from subjects to disciplines. Uh, the, the current coalition government um, seems to be very keen on subjects. It always amazes me that uh, politicians believe the best form of education for everyone is the one they had. And I always think this is a rather risky process to hold yourself up as the best example you can think of of the fruits of education. But there is a drive currently in the UK to push back, as I understand it, to a narrow conception of subjects. Chemistry is not a subject, maths is not a subject, history is certainly not a subject. A much better word for the components of a curriculum, or the elements or the domains, I, I believe is discipline because a discipline isn't just propositional knowledge, it's, uh, it's about skills and processes and procedures. Mathematicians will tell you that. A mathematician isn't just learning information, they're learning skills and process like a musician is or like a dancer is. So I think we should, we should support a shift to, from subjects to disciplines and it's not trivial to say that because it supports a second shift which is from seeing knowledge as being static to seeing it as dynamic. Uh, the human mind is intensely fertile and human communities are intensely creative when they're allowed to be. Knowledge is evolving at the most extraordinary exponential rate. It is a dynamic process. What schools are often encouraged to do is to st stop the world so it can be taught and it can't be stopped. Uh, we have to engage with the flow of knowledge and with the evolution of understanding. And we therefore need forms of curricula which are open and dynamic and not based on a narrow view of ten subjects. The second area of teaching and learning uh, seems to me absolutely critical. The heart of education is teaching. And there are no schools that are better than the teachers who work in them. There aren't. But we do need to move, I think, in two directions. One is from uh, 
education being seen as a solitary activity to one that's seen as a collaborative activity or a collaborative process. Um, you know, we'd still teach children in groups, but too rarely do we teach them as groups. And if we know anything about learning, it's that we learn from each other. We learn from collaboration. We learn from uh, other people's encouragement or their challenging us. Outside of education, most activities are like that. Um, but inside schools, we've become atomized. And of course, the emphasis on standardized testing tends to make it worse. It's one of the reasons I was so great an advocate for drama, because it's essentially a collaborative learning process. Um, and making that shift, I think, from, uh, from a process that's solitary to collaborative also supports a move from seeing education as being passive to one that's active. And you'll find that in the mainstream of progressive education as far back as you care to go, that active learning always trumps passive reception of information. People learn better, they learn faster, they learn more effectively, they take things in at a, at a deeper level, and it has a more profound effect on them. Uh, the emphasis on standardized testing has tended to encourage passivity and not activity. It's one of the reasons why I've been such a strong advocate of creativity in education. And the third shift is in assessment. I think we have to see assessment as moving from judgment to description. A lot of our uh, assessment procedures are reductive in the extreme. I remember years ago uh, talking to a girl who would just done a four-year program in dance and I said, what did you get out of it? And she said, I got a B. Well, you know, she did, you know, but that doesn't begin to capture what she really got from it. Uh, just going back to Francis' point, that if you tell a teacher there are three, they think there are three all year. And everything we know about teaching and learning is focused on the idea that we achieve best when our expectations are raised and when we are encouraged and supported. Uh, if we're branded, if we're uh, stereotyped, people tend to play unwittingly to the stereotype. So we need forms of education, uh, of assessment, which are descriptive and not judgmental. And we need forms of uh, assessment that are empowering rather than disenfranchising. And what that really means, I think, are forms of assessment which focus on the complexities of learning rather than trying to reduce them to a single number or grade. They can be useful at times, but they don't at all meet you know, the real needs of education. Well, I think, in short, that we don't have to start this revolution. It's already happening. We have to have confidence that we're part of the movement and, uh, and not feel that we have to wait for somebody else to start it for us. I think if you're waiting for a government to start the revolution, you'll be waiting a long time. Uh, what governments always try to do is to adapt to changing circumstances, uh, and they're, but they're too often fraught with short-term interests and objectives with the next poll. And education is a long-term process which affects your students, your kids, you and the people you work with right now. And it's therefore important, I think, to take hope from the fact that the situation isn't uh, static, it's moving forward. And we need to be part, as we've often said, of the solution for the revolution and not part of the problem. <laughs>